for this discussion, you got to keep in mind that your asymmetric brain uses your asymmetric body to move your asymmetric visual system, auditory system, olfactory, don't know, but since one knows nostril is usually a little bigger than the other, don't know if the olfactory system is asymmetrical or not, but your brain, your asymmetrical brain is using your asymmetrical body to move your asymmetrical sensors through space. That's what this discussion is all about. You got to remember that that human body is not symmetrical. So this right dominance that's produced by this inherent asymmetry means that our brain will sense things on the right side more than the left. That's why you, you see the bigger green circles on the right side, right molars more than left molars. That's normal. Right, bigger right diaphragm, more sense through the right hip joint, more sense of the ground underneath the right foot. That's because of our normal asymmetry. You have a dominant side. It doesn't matter whether you're left-handed or right-handed. The way our brain is organized and the way that the organs are internally placed produces this very typical asymmetry that makes us right dominant. And that's all normal. For me, this whole situation ended up in a mixed dominance issue with a more dominant left eye and sometimes probably a left ear that was more dominant, which is considered in, in some, by some neuroscientists and doctors as pathological. Don't, it, that sounds bad. It just means it's, it's not normal lateralization. It's best to have right ear, right eye, right molar, right diaphragm, well, that's always gonna be there, right hip sense and right heel more so than having things being sensed unequally because that is actually in the literature more likely to create cranial issues, visual issues, and jaw, teeth, malocclusion issues. This is a picture of a normal left AIC patterned foot. So when the pelvis comes forward on the left, the body tends to shift more to the right as the sacrum, unfortunately this doesn't have a sacrum, as the sacrum rotates to the right. That will put your body more on the right side. In that position, you'll generally find a right foot that has a raised arch because that right foot comes up as the body weight goes in that direction. That's a more supinated right foot. Most people will feel their weight on the outside of the right foot and more towards the heel. And then on the left side, you'll usually see a pronated left foot. So the, the arch on the left foot is flatter uh, in a more pronated state. They'll generally sense their left arch and their left big toe. So that's the state neurologically that the brain is more likely to sense in this normal left AIC pattern, a right heel and a left arch and left big toe. So that's a normal configuration. You see this probably on about 80% of people. Now, that's all normal. It's nothing to be concerned about, completely normal. Now this picture shows my feet. Uh, this picture I took a long, long time ago in, in the beginning of my studies, so to speak. And when you look at the fabric around those big toes, it's because I was trying to resensitize my big toes. Uh, because my second toe is kind of sl uh, slightly longer than my big toe. And that can cause some problems because if you're supposed to push through the big toe primarily, but then when you are actually going to push, your brain is actually sensing the second toe instead of the first toe. It's going to influence how well you can toe off, how well you can push to the opposite side. So that's, I'm not going to get too much into that right now. But what I do want you to look at is both of my feet were in a supinated state. So I would feel my weight on the outside of both of my feet. And when someone tells me that, they're usually going to test with a pelvis forward on both sides. They're usually, quite often they're going to be in this PEC pattern where the pelvis is forward on both sides. Now, the problem here is that in itself is not a huge deal. But the problem for me was that my left foot has a slightly extra curve to it. It's called metatarsus adductus. And that extra little curve on my left foot makes my left heel, or my left, I'm sorry, makes my left arch a little bit steeper. It's not necessarily higher, it's just steeper. And when I put my left foot, when I'm standing on a flat floor, that steepness to the left arch makes my left foot feel like the right foot should in the normal pattern. So my left foot is so unstable because of this higher arch and this, and this extra little curve to it that it feels like the more supinated foot. And my right foot feels like the more pronated foot. Now, sometimes you will see people with a right arch that's more down, that's more collapsed. 
And when you see that, you know something's going on. It's not a good, you don't, from a PRI perspective, that's not what you want to see. You do see that sometimes, and I know that's a compensatory issue. So I'm already thinking sensory at that point. Uh, but normally, in the normal left AIC pattern, when the pelvis is forward on the left, people will feel their left arch flatter and their right arch higher. And that's, my pelvis was to the right. I was still in this pattern. But that's not what I felt underneath. So my brain was getting different signals. My brain was getting this signal from my feet that my left foot was higher and my right foot was lower, which would indicate a body that's actually shifted to the left. That's what we're trying to establish to counteract the left AIC pattern. We're trying to give people that sense because they have the other sense. But that's how I was existing sensorily. And on, but on top of that, I still had this bigger right diaphragm. So the, me the messages were mixed. Remember that bigger right diaphragm, the bigger right diaphragm wants to pull you to the right. So I had the bigger right diaphragm pulling me to the right, but my feet were not matching up with sensorily what, and, and physically what was going on in the body with that diaphragm. And that created a lot of problems. And I know my left foot is the crux of the issue, but it also uh, created a bit of bow-leggedness uh, in my left foot, uh, I'm sorry, my left, my left tibia, and that would affect the knee and, and everything else. So I would normally sense most of my weight on the outside of my left foot compared to my right, and that's not normal. This created another issue is my left big toe n just never got to bend properly. And it's pretty much arthritic at this point. So what that means is I can't really get good toe off. Uh, my left big toe doesn't push me to my right side very effectively. Now, that's what most people are already doing too, too well. This left AIC pattern is basically you're existing in a state of left toe push off and right heel strike. Uh, so that's what puts us over on that right side. So that's why sensorially your brain is kind of sensing you in right stance and left swing. So my left big toe couldn't push me over to my right side which is the dominant pattern. That's what the left big toe loves to do, push us back to our right side, our dominant side, as quickly as possible. I couldn't even do that. So that means we're all, we all have this left AIC pattern of right dominance built inside of us. I didn't even have that functioning. So I didn't even have a left AIC pattern. I don't think I had either pattern. I don't think I had a left AIC pattern or a right AIC pattern in, in the sense that I kind of had half of a pattern on each side. That was not a good thing. And that left big toe still doesn't uh, bend too easily. And I've rectified the situation a little bit. And I, uh, well, yeah, I've rectified the situation to a degree by cutting my orthotics and then cutting my insoles into three quarters length. And now I actually feel my toes a lot more as I walk. And uh, it produces a different effect. And it, was, it gives me the ability to sense my muscles during PRI techniques. Uh, in a way that I hadn't uh, sensed them before. So back to the high arches and flat floors issue. When your foot, when your foot hits the, oh yeah, when your foot hits the ground. Now this is not a perfect picture on the right, uh, but because your heel would actually hit like this with the toes kind of still up, but doesn't matter. Your brain will sense the ground come up underneath your right heel. Then as your weight comes forward, as your leg moves forward and the tibia moves forward and your body weight progresses forward the arch should come down into pronation, but pronation is not just a mechanical movement. This is what people do not understand. Is that pronation? Yes, but it's not pronation unless the brain can sense something coming up underneath the arch. Otherwise, it's not pronation. Your feet exist in relation to the ground. Flat floors are not conducive to effective pronation or heel strike. Because there's nothing, if you have, especially if you have a high arch. If you have a lower arch, it's probably not as big a deal. So, of course, this doesn't apply to every single person equally. And that's what people don't get either. It's not an all or nothing proposition here. But people with higher arches, and I do have a high arch, if you're, flat, if you're barefooted on a flat floor, there's no ground coming up underneath the arch of that right foot. So you're, there's no pronation going on it, because there's no relationship to the ground. So sensorily, your brain, which works off of pressure sense, nothing else, well, frequencies, light, frequencies of light and auditory frequencies, and, and pressure, that's what it, that's what, and temperature, but we're not really talking about temperature. Those sensory nerves in our feet and in our hands are well, that's what it's responding to, pressure. There's no pressure there. 
So you, if there's no pressure, you can't pronate, you can't shift to the opposite side. So that's the, the issue with you know, minimalist shoes, this idea that a minimalist shoe is actually more natural. No, what's unnatural are flat floors. If my high arch was existing on real earth that was undulating and had movement to it, and, would be, and every step, step I took, that ground would be hitting my foot in all different directions, and not just underneath the heel, but around the edges of the heel, and that's what we really care about at heel strike, I probably wouldn't have this issue. So if I, and this is just a picture of my orthotics. You can see on the left orthotic, I've shaved down the arch so much, and yet I still sense my left arch more than my right arch, which again is not normal. Uh, well, that's not what we want. We want to sense our right arch more than our left. So sensorially speaking, I'm still sensing my left arch too much, even as I shave down these orthotics more and more and more. And you can see I cut the orthotic into a, uh, into a three, three quarters length. But again, it's all sensory. It's not biomechanics. It's sensory. Sensory drives biomechanics. It is not a biomechanical issue. You have, will have altered biomechanics, but that's because the sensory input got disrupted, which then created the altered biomechanics. So why does it matter what was going on in the feet? Well, because if, if it's not a stretch of the imagination for you to think that if there's something going wrong with the feet, they're not, being, they're not moving properly, and so sensory input through the feet is not working properly, it's probably not a stretch of the imagination for you to realize that that will influence the pelvis because of it just affects everything, the tibia and then the femur that attaches to the pelvis. So for most people, they can, they can, they can understand the pelvis part. But they can't understand how it would affect the cranium and the jaw and the teeth and the visual system and the auditory system. Well, this, well, the cranial sacral people know it, and they've made these observations for 100 years that the, 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 the bones of the cranium, especially, particularly the temporal bones, and the bones of the pelvis move the exact same way. And so that is the connection. You can even see the bottom, cranial bones and pelvic relationship. Uh, that's a book about the polarity process. I can't, uh, something about polarity. Uh, but the skull showing its relationships to the pelvis. We call this a skull and this a pelvis. Those are just arbitrary names. Uh, they move the exact same way. Sphenoid, sacrum. Iliums, temporal bones. All right, so those, are, those connections are absolutely real. They've absolutely been recognized by osteopathic doctors who are medical doctors. Uh, it's just never been put together that the way postural restoration puts everything together. So here you can see my cranium. At a very young age, I couldn't have been more than six or seven years of age in this first picture, you can see already my left eye and my left ear are higher than my right eye and my right ear. And it's not just how I'm standing, that's how it was. And then if you move into my teenage years, you see it's actually even worse. And what's so interesting is my nose is straight up and down, but my face is revolving, orienting, growth pattern, around that nose and the right side of my head, now it's probably reversed in the picture, but the right side of my head is actually collapsing. And this is a torsion pattern. This is a twist in the cranium that's going on developmentally. And that automatic, if someone walks in and I see this, I know they're gonna be in a forward head posture. And that's what you're gonna see. Look at me walking. I was already in that hyperextended I had an extreme lordosis. My head and neck were forward. I was always looking down as I was walking. Why would I always look down? Because I had to use my visual system because my feet were senseless. My brain couldn't even sense my, my, they were not giving proper feedback. So that's all vestibular system, all these signals. Your brain is trying to integrate visual system, auditory system, and through your feet of the ground to give your inner ear, the vestibular system, the information it needs to understand how to keep you upright and balanced. For me, that whole system was going wrong, and I think that's probably why I developed tinnitus at 13 years of age. Uh, because as I've gotten more, you know, unwinded and better grounded, my tinnitus is not as bad as it used to be. It's still there, and it still, it still bothers me to a degree, not nearly as much as it used to. So, but uh, that I really do think the tinnitus had something to do with everything I just talked about, and then what was going on inside my oral cavity. So this is a picture of my palate. Uh, this is actually, this. so this is my current palate, and I did get some expansion, very little, very little bit, which made things more equal. So the palate itself, and it's, it's a little bit, yeah, it, it's actually fine. So the, the angle of the picture is not perfect, so the palate itself is not really the issue. What is the issue is called the premaxilla, and so 
you'll see the orange the orange dotted line is kind of the the mid sagittal suture but then in the front the red line is the dividing line it's called the the there's an actual name for this bone but it's the just premaxillary bone and it contains the incisors and you can see that that has been shifted to the right so for some reason and i actually believe it has to do with this inappropriate left foot sense that created facial development in the wrong direction normally if you see anything you'd rather have it be to the left because as we shift over onto our right side our head and body have to twist back to the left to stay straight that's a normal pattern but if someone's over on their right side and the twist goes to the right that doesn't make sense. You're just getting locked into this cranial twist, and that's not a good outcome. And I, people who are in this twist are suffering, and I don't think people realize how much suffering they are. And they, they, are, not no, they are no longer your normal PRI client, patient. They're not going to be able to do the same things that you give to people who don't have these issues. And if you try to force it upon them, it could make them feel even, even worse. So... My pre-teeth, my, my pre-maxillary teeth, my incisors are shifted over to that right side. And then, of course, my jaw went, well, this is my right, so my jaw went with it, and my front teeth on the right have also been taken over to the right side. So what did that produce over time? Well, this is uh, the scan. You'll see that my jaw is not, my, my left eye is higher than my right. You can see it. In the in the scan but also my jaw I have a can't it's down on the right higher on the left and thing and it created a cross bite on the on my right side and so you can see in the picture of, I guess I was probably in my late 20s in this picture because I had such a full head of hair and it wasn't gray uh, and I just looked younger I was also way more muscular but way more in pain so strength has nothing to do with pain I can tell you that actually the, if you're in this position and you're weightlifting you're probably gonna want to stop because you're just gonna reinforce the worst position you can possibly be in but anyway my mandible is, has shifted even more to the right and my right canine got kicked out that's when I see right canines that are displaced it's not a good sign uh, it created malocclusion and cross bites are bad they will lock you into a pattern because now it's giving your brain in a, it's no different it's no di pressure sense it's no different than having inappropriate pressure underneath your feet because your feet weren't developed properly uh, the pressure from the ground changes what how your brain will activate muscles in your legs and hips and pressure between your teeth will change how your brain or will influence or does create differentials in muscular activity of not only the jaw muscles, but then it also travels into the neck, which then pulls your chest up, and now you're stuck in the state of extension. So that's what it did to my cranium and my dental configuration. But even more importantly, what it do to the back of my head. So any doctor should know, or any medical professional should know, that this area, how your head sits on your neck, a chiropractor could tell you this, the importance of all the of all the nerves that travel through this area it's not open <laughs> there's no space there's lots of stuff going all through that area and this needs to be relaxed and that head this neck needs to alternate as we move this head has to be free to rotate and side bend without restriction when you don't bad things start to happen neurologically a lot of weird symptomology uh, autonomic nervous system issues are happening because of compression on one side or both sides depending on how much of a forward head posture you're in through all this important nerve and, and, and blood vessels and arteries uh, so much so many nerves going through this neck that influence everything down low you know definitely the arms and all the way down to the rest of the body and here you can see my left ear is so much higher than my right ear Everything is being pushed down on the right, and now you're going to see a lot of compression through this right side. And this right OA joint is the joint that we are most concerned with in postural restoration, because if you cannot unjam this right side, there's going to be major problems. Now, of course, this is also related to airflow. And in the picture on the left, you'll see that my right collarbone is very visible. That's the, that's the influence of 
neck breathing and a subclavius. And if you, if you have an overactive subclavius and you're neck breathing and you can't inhibit that, you could try every PRI technique in the book and it's not going to change a thing. But the problem is identifying what it is and how to rectify it. Because remember, your neck, I've made so many videos about this, your neck which means you're not going to be diaphragmatically breathing. And if you can't diaphragmatically breathe, you can't get out of extension. They all go together. You're still stuck in the pattern. But again, the issue is, is that neck and subclavius only overactive because you became too much of a neck breather because you, you know, your normal pattern, perfectly normal. And maybe you, you were fine until you started working at a desk and now you're just not moving anymore and you're doing repetitive tasks and your tension levels go up. Life happens. And now that right side dominance became too right sided, and now you've just your neck and your subclavius became overactive, and now you can't undo it. Could be it happens all the time. But what also go what also influences the neck? Well, the visual system, the teeth, the jaw, and your auditory system. So just to say release the neck, well, you might not be able to. That's why you need someone to help you. When I say you need someone to help you from a professional, it's not a money grab. <laughs> I'm not saying me. I'm saying find a PRI provider from the PRI website because if you choose the wrong techniques or you try to do something that your brain simply will not allow, you may end up feeling worse. And if you're in considerable amount of pain and you try to do some sort of online program that you see or you see techniques on other, web, uh, on other YouTube channels, I don't put a lot for this exact reason because I know if you're in significant amount of pain, do, you're not going to get what you need off of a YouTube channel, even mine. I can just show you that this is occurring or potentially occurring, but you need someone who knows what they're doing to walk you through this process. So after I released that subclavius, which was, you know, compensatory breathing, you could see the difference in my shoulder, that right collarbone receded. Uh, and my shoulders also, that right shoulder dropped down a little bit. That subclavius, and I would say probably about 50% of people that come to see me in person need that subclavius released. And then also what you'll see is, I don't have any pictures of my own testing from back in the day because I was just doing this on my own and I didn't, again, I didn't, in the beginning, I didn't really know what I was doing. But you can see my left shoulder in the first picture has no horizontal abduction whatsoever. That's extension. Again, it was most, it was coming from my neck and my visual system, my jaw. But, and then after I, I did this little technique where I used my left heel and my right arch, I was very happy with that left horizontal abduction. It did get better, but that's still not enough. Now, unwinding this whole situation did require a splint, mandibular splint. I've made videos about this, about dental integration. I'm going to have another video coming up in a couple weeks after I interview another PRI therapist about how he does it. Uh, but beyond that, it can also work itself into your visual system and your auditory system. Now, auditory is not really talked about much because it's so hard to figure out. But let me just go about the visual system. And it's funny. I finally have someone who I did an online consultation with that has the exact same issue as what I'm showing you here. At some point, my brain dropped off my left eye, just stopped paying attention to it. And what I noticed was uh, when I would try to, with two eyes open at that point, I really, I couldn't touch my toes and you could see how slanted my back is. But then when I would close my right eye, I could easily touch my toes and my back is more, um, more flat. It, less, it looks less scoliotic. And I, find, I finally did a consultation with someone. He's in the exact same situation. So the only reason I knew what to do with him and what to test for was because I went through it. And it's, it's exactly the same thing. In fact, if he, moves his, if he just stands there, moves his eyes to the right, and tries to touch his toes, he can't even get started. His back is so tight. But if he looks to the left, he can. I know he's overusing his right eye, because, um, and hopefully he'll send me a video. Uh, but I told him to buy some reading glasses, pop out the left side to try to blur the right eye a little bit. And he sent, he did send me a video, but he needs to send another one. And if he has the reading glasses on, which is blurring his right eye so his brain has to use his left eye more, he can touch his toes, doesn't matter where he looks. So hopefully that'll be coming up. Uh, but yeah, he's ha why his brain decided to drop off his left eye and only use his right eye? I think it has to do with computer work, too much screen time, and lack of movement in general. I've had a lot of younger people in their 20s come to see me recently, and their bodies are being held hostage by their visual system. And I honestly think it's from all the screens. This is a generation that has grown up on computers and phones. Your visual system was not designed to look up close for extended periods of time. 
and you are not designed to sit for hours upon hours upon hours. You are designed to move and look in the distance and occasionally look up close. So I think that's really the issue with a lot of, and that's why these patterns are getting put on steroids at younger and younger ages. Being right dominant is not a problem. It's modern life that makes this right dominance a problem because we're no longer living natural lives. Too many flat floors, lack of movement, too many computers, case closed in my mind. Uh, and that's what people are gonna be dealing with. Now this one, is gonna be a little bit more interesting. So let me just set the stage here. Once you lose the ground underneath your left heel, underneath your left foot, which I've probably never had, you've lost a vestibular input. When you lose a vestibular input, your brain has to use another sense to try to keep you upright. When you look at that picture again, I'm gonna show it again after this, my pelvis is shifted over to the right, this is your right, yet my upper body's kind of falling to the left. And this is why I think it occurred. So what, let me just set the stage. Right now I'm sitting in a chair, I'm barefoot. And I'm in a very uh, boring room. There's no outside sound, I'm, in, I'm just in a room. When I play a high frequency voice or a low frequency, a female voice or a male voice, just an audiobook, a neutral audiobook, there's no emotion behind it, so emotions can't play a role. You're gonna see what happens to my body when my brain, when my, my bare feet, I'm barefoot, sitting down, which is harder than standing up because there's less gravity pushing you into the floor. When it hears the high frequency or the low frequency, you're gonna see what happens to my body. Here's the high frequency voice. My body shifts to the left. And then I turn it off. And my body goes back to the center. And I do a high frequency voice, oh sorry, low frequency voice. My body shifts even more to the left. All right, and then what I'm gonna do is, I'm, going, I'm just gonna let it roll here. What I do is I put on a little heel cup to, for my brain to sense my left heel being squeezed. And then I'm going to play the same frequencies, the same voices. And when I play the, nothing changes. My body just stays. Uh, doesn't matter whether it's low frequency or a high frequency. I'm just staying there. Now, this is what's so fascinating. Again, when my brain is sensing my left heel, which means it's sensing the ground, or it doesn't know what the ground is, but it's sensing pressure around the heel, which is a substitute for a flat floor, or a lack of, of undulating ground, I stay centered. But once I've lost that heel sense, my brain will tune into a frequency, and I know it's my left ear, because if I plug the left ear, I'll also stay centered. Uh, I go to the left, and I think that's what you're seeing in that, pec in that picture. That cranial torque, whenever you have a cranial torque or a, a torsion, you don't know, all bets are off. You're no longer a normal PRI client slash patient. You don't know what your brain has done to maintain upright postural stability uh, in the absence of appropriate floor sense. And that's why this all still comes back to the ground. So just for reference, uh, 2018, you can see my head is really still tilted down on the right. Uh, 2022, it's a grainy pic. Actually, I, I took it from a video. That's why it looks so grainy. You can see things are way more balanced. And then this is just a uh, picture kind of collage. Again, as a young kid, um, you can already see the, the asymmetry. And then the middle picture, I think I was, I think that was 2018. And then this year, uh, my you can see my cranium is wider again. It's interesting when you look at my childhood picture, and I think it's because the head <laughs> grows before the face. So my head was nice and round. And then, but as I started to grow, the, my facial development and my cranium, almost like it switched. <laughs> so my cranium got really, really tight, and now it expanded again. So that's, that's what's cranial expansion. But again, that was all because in my belief that was all because I never had the ground underneath my left foot, uh, which led to compensatory changes and growth and developmental changes through my face and my cranium, which affected my sensory systems. And I had to unwind all of this over the past 12 years. And it has not been easy. It's been very trying and difficult, um, especially during COVID because the life just, every, all our lives just got turned upside down. So I regressed horribly in 2020, 2021, 2022. And I got back on track in 2023 when I finally got a better splint. Uh, and then I also talked about how my vision was being, I was being way overprescribed for my 
farsightedness. Uh, so, you know, it, it's been a, an amazing journey. I don't even know what I'm going to do going forward since I've kind of uncovered everything I need to uncover. Um, but hopefully uh, this has been enlightening for you. You might not understand it. You Hopefully you know what PRI is and uh, this will help you understand that it's not, a bi it's not a biomechanical issue. It's all about neurology, how your brain is sensing where you are in space compared to your environment and then how to navigate through that space. That's what this is all about, navigation through space. Have a good day.